All right, so hopefully you, uh, you're there in Isaiah 53. We're in verses 1 through 3. That's our text. The topic, a future generation of Israelites will believe God's report that Jesus is their Messiah. The title of our message, He Reports, You Decide. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we, of course, humble ourselves before you. We have no understanding of your word unless you open our eyes and our hearts and our hearing, Lord, to it. It's not revealed through intelligence or anything that we might possess, but by a spiritual transaction as God the Holy Spirit teaches us your word. We believe your word is alive, that it's powerful, Lord, sharper than any two-edged sword, that it divides between the soul and the spirit in a way that nothing else can, that no other voice can. And once you have our attention there, Lord, you are able to encourage and exhort and, and bless us and, uh, in so many ways, Lord, more than we would ever ask or think. Whether we've come with expectation or not, Lord, you want to minister to us. And, and so we give you this next 30 or 40 minutes, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. In 1964, the Warren Commission report concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone in assist, uh, assassinating President John F. Kennedy. My dad said it was the CIA. Of course, he also maintained that all homeless people are millionaires and that seat belts kill more people than they save. <laughs> Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is a reliable source. He's on the record saying there is overwhelming evidence that the CIA was involved in my uncle's murder. So maybe my dad was right about a few other things. He also told me you won't go to college to get stupid. Uh, and that, that is half true. But anyway, <laughs> you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to be suspicious of government reports. In the 8th century BC, God released a report. His report can be trusted 100%. He's not a man that he should lie, and all the promises of God in Jesus are yes, and in him, amen. Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12 is a song with three verses in each of five stanzas. Bible commentators use every superlative in the English language to underscore the prominence of this text. We're going to look at each of the five stanzas separately. We started last week, and now we're in the second one. And I'll organize my comments about this stanza around two questions. Number one, do you accept God's report? And number two, are you ashamed of God's report? And so let's talk about accepting it in verses one and two. Also in 1964, the Surgeon General published Smoking and Health. It concluded that cigarette smoking was responsible for a 70% increase in the mortality rate of smokers over non-smokers. It estimated that average smokers had a nine to tenfold risk of developing lung cancer compared to non-smokers. Now, my dad believed the Surgeon General's report. He quit smoking that day, cold turkey, and never smoked again, except for the exploding cigar we got him at Disneyland. But that didn't work out so well because he tried to smoke it in the car as we were uh, driving. Now, it would have been bad, but then he said, man, this tastes terrible, and he threw it out. And so who knows what might have been. There are a plethora of reports circulating that tell you how to live, if you think of it this way. How many religions are there? Well, experts say that there are 12 major religions and 4,000 plus faith groups. I'm not sure what that means, but there are a lot. Each one can be seen as a report about who or what is worshiped as God and why. There's always reading to do. There's always some book, some holy book that tells you the condition that you're in supposedly and how to get out of it. And uh, one thing that's uh, consistent with all the religions is that they're all based on works. It, it, they all have to do with what you should, ought, must do in order to be pleasing to God. It's anyone's guess how many philosophies there are. They, too, are a report on the human condition. Uh, they're like a religion without a God, uh, making man God and trying to figure out, you know, the best thing. And then there are the psychologies. There's lots of them. None of them have a very good success rate. They can't all be right, and in fact, none of them are. 
God's inspired authoritative word, the Bible, is a report of the human condition. It's the only accurate report, and that makes sense since God is the creator of the universe and made you in his image. And so you would expect God to know all about you, the most about you, and for all these other things to be uh, not just secondary, but to be lies. Is God's report reliable? Well, how do we know, for example, that we're reading Isaiah? One word, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is actually four words. See, see how funny that was? Anyway, the Dead Sea Scrolls are a collection of ancient Jewish manuscripts. They were discovered over a span of 10 years between 1946 and 1956 at the Qumran Caves, the northern shore of the Dead Sea. They date from the third century BC to the first century AD. They include the oldest surviving manuscripts of entire books of the Bible and some extra biblical manuscripts. The great Isaiah scroll, they call it, one of the seven Dead Sea Scrolls that were first to be discovered. It is the entire book of Isaiah from beginning to end, apart from a few small damaged portions. It is 1,000 years older than the oldest Hebrew manuscript known before it was discovered. It is almost identical to the most recent manuscript version from the 900s. Scholars discovered a handful of spelling and tense-oriented scribal errors, but no difference of any significance. And one commentator wrote this, the Old Testament that we read today is the same one that existed in 100 BC to 200 BC. This means that the over 300 Old Testament prophecies of the coming of Messiah pre-existed the birth of Jesus Christ. And so this scroll, we know the age of this scroll, and we know that it predated the birth of Jesus Christ. And see, so with absolute confidence, we can say that it is a prophecy. In fact, it, it resolves in 300 prophecies of the coming of the Lord. And that's tremendous, really. You know, a lot of times people will say to you, oh, the Bible is, you know, uh, you can't be trusted and all of these things. And so God says, well, how, how about we discover the great Isaiah scroll together, which proves that I've given you a reliable document that you can trust. And so God's report to us is not just the book of Isaiah, not even just the Old Testament. It is his complete revelation in the entire Bible. It's one report given progressively. There are around 35 reporters or writers mentioned by name. It was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Koine Greek, common Greek, over a span of 1,500 years from three continents. And yet it tells one consistent story from Genesis to Revelation of God's romance of redemption, how he will redeem the lost human race. Now, reports can usually be summarized in just a few words. My summary of God's report would be sin, the Savior, and salvation. Sin. In the beginning, just two chapters in, we read about Adam and Eve disobeying God's one simple, very keepable command. In an essay, Richard Phillips writes, original sin is a term that defines the nature of mankind's sinful condition because of Adam's fall. It teaches that all people are corrupted by Adam's sin through natural generation, through birth, by which together with Adam's imputed condemnation, the judgment on sin, we all enter the world guilty before God. Original sin shows that we sin because we are sinners entering this world with a corrupt nature and without hope apart from the saving grace of God in the gospel. Uh, the Savior, while Adam and Eve, the serpent, were still in the garden, God preached the first gospel message. He said the seed of the woman would come and defeat the devil. As the Bible progresses, we come to understand that the seed of the woman would be God in human flesh. This God-man would act as our substitute. He would die in our place, taking upon himself the punishment that was due Adam and Eve and their descendants. And then salvation. Jesus died, but he rose from the dead. All humans who have no capacity to believe and all who can and do believe are counted as righteous and receive eternal life. All humans who have the capacity to believe but do not will be consigned to eternal conscious torment in the lake of fire. And so we pick it up in verse one of chapter 53. Who has believed our report? 
And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord is a synonym for his salvation. In chapter 59, verse 1, it says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. And so he's talking about uh, salvation. Who was salvation revealed to him? How do we know that we can be saved? Well, it was revealed to the nation of Israel. At the time of the confusing of languages at the Tower of Babel, God said, I'm going to start over with a brand new nation, and it's going to be through Abraham. He called Abraham. Abraham answered the call. His name was Abram at the time, and he began to follow the Lord. And because he believed God, it was accredited to him for righteousness. He was saved. And so Abraham started a new nation. He had a son, Isaac, who had a son, Jacob. He had 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. And to be complete, Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. The Apostle Paul explains what was revealed to them, what was revealed to Israel. He says in Romans chapter 9, to the Israelites pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. And so Paul says, now, through Israel have come all of these blessings from God to share with the world. We wouldn't know anything about uh, the law of Moses without Israel or the glory of God or the covenants or the service of the temple and the tabernacle. Uh, and ultimately, it is through Israel that the, the Messiah will come, born of a, a woman. God asked Israel, who has believed our report? The prophets, John the Baptist, Jesus, they all reported God's plan to the first century Jews. Uh, well, and and um, they were rejected. In fact, by rejected, we mean they were killed. Isaiah, not in the first century, but in the eighth century, gives the report uh, as far as he has it. We're reading it. And uh, they kill him eventually. Uh, the tradition says he was sawn in two, and he was beside himself with grief as a result of that. That's the old Isaiah joke, huh? Uh, <laughs> John the Baptist, killed by Herod. Jesus Christ, killed. The nation of Israel was tasked with presenting the Savior to the world as the solve for sin. He would set up the kingdom of God on earth with Jerusalem as its capital. All the nations of the earth would come and pay him homage. They would hear the gospel and multitudes would be saved. John the Baptist preceded Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came along. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The disciples were always asking Jesus about the kingdom. Can I be this in the kingdom? Can I be the mayor of Riverdale in the kingdom? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, and Jesus kept putting them off. At his ascension, they said, are you going to set up the kingdom now? And he says, don't worry about it. And he left. And, and the kingdom is so important. People think, oh, you know, it's no big deal. Maybe not to a Gentile, but the Jews have been promised this kingdom, and Jesus will establish it at some point. But here in our text, the Jews rejected it. The Savior came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Why? One answer is in verse 2. You know, there's so many things that we could say, but one important answer we see in verse 2, it says, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. This is the collective voice and testimony of Jews in the future time of Jacob's trouble that we more commonly call the Great Tribulation. They understand that their ancestors did not recognize Jesus, but they will. They will at a future time. I'm going to read verse 2 again, and then I'm going to read a little bit from the Revelation and just... Compare these in your mind. So in Isaiah 53, 2, talking about the Messiah, Isaiah says, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's not really any beauty that we should desire him. Now from the Revelation chapter 19. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. 
His name is called the Word of God. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Are Isaiah and the Apostle John talking about the same person? Well, yes, they are. It's Jesus. The first century Jews were anticipating the second coming of Jesus. And so when Jesus came the first time, lowly, without comeliness and all of these ways he's described, who is this? And he said, well, the miracle, even John the Baptist doubted at one point. And he said, go ask Jesus, are you the one? And Jesus says, look at what I've done. Look at the miracles. And, and he was saying, hey, I've proven that. I am the one. But the Jews, they, you know, they just didn't recognize. I'm not giving them an excuse. They could have and they should have. But when you're looking for Revelation 19 and you end up with Isaiah 53, that's as big a gap as you can get. That's a, a major, you talk about worldview, changing your worldview, that's huge. And so they did not recognize Jesus Christ. Now it says here, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. The tender plant is describing a sucker shoot that you might easily snap off of a tree or a bush. And the root out of dry ground is an anomaly. It's just something that grows for a short time and then doesn't have enough moisture to maintain. Now, I might be missing something deeper, an analogy perhaps, but this seems to be a pretty straightforward illustration of Jesus in what we call his humiliation. His humiliation consisted of, of becoming a human, of being born, and in that low condition made under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life. Can you imagine being God? No, you can't, but it's an expression. Can you imagine you and I being God and, and coming to earth? And, you know, I mean, it's, it's incredible to even try and meditate upon. Uh, he uh, endured a curse of death on the cross, and be, he was buried, and he continued under the power of death for a time until he rose from the dead. And so that's the humiliation of Jesus, becoming a human and going through those experiences. Now, notwithstanding God the Father's sovereignty, uh, Jesus was always in danger, Early on, the family had to flee to Egypt because Herod was seeking to what? Murder him. Jesus didn't use his deity to protect himself. He wasn't like the character Grogu who could teleport people or you know, do telekinesis and stuff and always pull it out. He was vulnerable as an infant. From the Garden of Eden forward, the salvation plan of God was a hair's breadth away from being thwarted. Wow. I mean, do you ever think about how fragile it is, how, how it almost comes to an end all the time in the Old Testament? At one point, you've got, I mean, pick any story, but you've got David and Goliath. How's that, right? Again, huge mismatch, right? Now, we're Christians looking back, and we say, yeah, that's the worst mismatch of all time because there's no way David's going to lose to some ugly giant, right? Because we know the Lord is involved. But from just an observational point of view, this is bad. This is a 12-foot man, uh, you know, some kind of giant, and a little boy who's 15 years old, a ruddy little boy with his sling, is how, how tall? Maybe five foot? Jews were short anyway, so he's like, I mean, this is, this is the odds are not good. Seems like one spear throw is going to do it, you know, and God intervenes. And so that's the way the whole Old Testament goes, right? It, Episode after episode, if you don't know what's going to happen, you're like, oh, they're, they're toast now. That's it. Israel's done. And then especially when they start sinning against God and he brings his own judgments against them. Serpents are coming into the camp and various plagues and all, and yet God keeps it going in his providence. It says here he has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. It doesn't mean Jesus was homely or undesirable. It's simply saying that Jesus wasn't the guy you'd pick at graduation as the most likely to be the savior of the world. He's not like the British Jesuses in you know, most of the movies or you know, the guy in uh, Jesus of Nazareth, which I like. I like Jesus of Nazareth, but Jesus is terrible in that. He literally does not blink. 
Uh, I'm not making that up. That was part of his character. And so he never blinks because it gives him kind of a, well, it gives him a weirdness is what it does. And it's all real metaphysical all the time. And you can't imagine him ever laughing or having a good time. He's just walking around with his eyes open all the time. Cut! I saw you blink, you know. They must have spent a fortune on eye drop. Probably in the credits, there's the eye drop guy. Eye drop assistant to Mr. So-and-so, you know. And, and they, they just always get it wrong. So Jesus, he's just an average. You wouldn't look into a crowd, oh, that's Jesus. Even after his ministry, Judas has to bring the Romans to him and point him out because they're not going to recognize him. They won't know who he is. There's no most wanted posters, you know, or sketch artists, you know. And so you, you got to come with us and show us who it is because we won't know. And so that's what they're saying. You think Jesus of, uh, was charismatic? I don't mean in the biblical sense of Pentecostalism. I mean just as a personality. It's okay to think of him that way as long as you realize that it was because his Father in heaven and the Holy Spirit were at work in his life is why he spoke like no one else ever had and why children were not afraid of him and came to him as a refuge. Think of it this way. If someone is naturally charismatic and God is using them, we tend to think it's because of their personality. Now, obviously, God can and does use charismatic individuals, but it's not a prerequisite. And in some cases, it can be a, uh, a burden. A case can be made that God gets more glory from Somebody that you really, you know, who was that mass man kind of a thing, you know? Who was that was teaching the gospel? We don't know, but, but it's the power of God unto salvation. And so uh, we, always want to, we always want to be careful to give God the glory, right? Give God the glory, glory, rise and shine. And, okay. Children of the Lord. Arky, arky. That's, uh, you guys need to play that sometime. You familiar with that? Maybe I'll sing it later. Way later. Anyway, listen, if you haven't received God's report, let's say you're here today, you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. We're happy that you're here. We love that you're here. It's, it's wonderful you're here. We know that you're here by a divine appointment and not uh, you know, by any of your own means and stuff. God wants you here. Uh, I was just praying with one of the guys after service about a fellow that he shared Christ with a, a few months ago who is dead now, 40-year-old, and, um, you know, uh, car accident, God was speaking to him, trying to get him ready for what was going to happen because, you know, it's appointed to all of us once to die, and after this judgment, and we sit here and we think, well, 40 years old, that's young. Of course it's young. You know what? 90 years old is young when you consider eternity. And so, you know, people die young, they die old. We don't want you to die without Jesus Christ because there's no chance after death for you to be saved. And so whatever report you're reading, whether whatever religion, whatever philosophy, whatever psychology, whatever, whatever, it's wrong. And the Bible that you have or that your friend has or that somebody next to you have, it's telling you the truth. And it can be proven. We've got a thousand-year-old manuscript, you know, that says, hey, this is going to happen, and then it happens. Nostradamus doesn't do that. He says, guba laba sintra, or something like that. And then people say, oh, say guba, that's another word for scuba, and that means the World War II is going to end. Oh, yeah, I see that. Are you, are you ashamed of God's report? Verse 3, let's get out of that. Who is the poster boy for Scientology? Tom Cruise, not John Travolta. Remember John Travolta? He was famous once. Tom Cruise, he's a pretty great poster boy from the world's point of view. He's handsome, he's charismatic, he's talented, he's successful, does his own stunts. Who would be the poster boy for Christianity? It's not Jesus in this case. I mean, obviously, he's, he's Jesus. But other than Jesus, who's the poster boy for Christianity? Give somebody else a chance. Paul the Apostle would be my choice. I nominate Paul. The missionary giant, estimated to have traveled 10,000 miles on foot preaching the gospel. He probably planted close to 20 churches that we know of, with many more born out of those by his apprentice leaders. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, at least 13 were attributed to Paul, maybe 14, depending on the book of Hebrews. That's great. 
but nobody is gonna put him on a poster. You wanna know why? In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in death often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen. In perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. He had a terrible eye condition that was difficult for people to even look at him. And he described some kind of thorn in his flesh that contributed to constant physical pain and weakness. You know, online I'm seeing a lot, I'm hearing a lot too about the, you, these uh, AI programs that will draw for you. I, I, I would like, one of you do this, uh, if you feel comfortable. Go there and say, I would like you to draw this and read 2 Corinthians that I just read and see what kind of picture they come up with of Paul the Apostle and then imagine him on a poster. I mean, you want to kill your recruiting this is the guy. I mean, and, and I, think, I think Paul, you know, if he would show up at your church, you'd think, who is this guy? This guy looks like he's been beaten. His face is sagging. There's some talk that he had, you know, Bell's palsy and all these other weird things. He probably barely walk. He gets them to say, I was just dead a few minutes ago. And uh, <laughs> I mean, this guy, this guy, he, there's no way, you know, that, that you would put him up as, as the poster boy, or would you? because he really was. And so that's, you know, some our thinking needs a lot of adjusting here. He is despised and rejected, verse three, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. The prophetic perfect tense is a literary technique that describes future events that are so certain to occur that they're referred to in a past tense as if they had already happened. So who hid their faces and despised Jesus and didn't esteem him? Well, that would be the leaders of the nation of Israel at the Lord's first coming. These Jews are looking back at that first century error. And more importantly, they are going to recognize the Lord having to suffer first as their Messiah. We keep referencing this future generation of Jews. They are the Jews in the future time of Jacob's trouble in the Great Tribulation. The 12th chapter of the Old Testament book of Zechariah describes a future time when all the world's armies will be gathered against Israel to destroy them. And then this will happen. This is chapter 12, verse 10. He says, I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn. In other words, the Apostle Paul puts it like this, and so all Israel will be saved. And so before the Lord returns, or in conjunction with his second coming, although two-thirds of the Israelites living during that time will be killed according to the scripture, one-third will realize that their ancestors made a mistake in the first century and that Jesus of Nazareth was and is their Messiah, and then the heavens will break open and the Lord will come back in that second coming that they've been waiting for with his armies, which when you get into the revelation, that is you and I, because we've been raptured out, resurrected out to come back with him. Um, All Israel will be saved. One thing I said we'd notice in chapter 53 is that each stanza can be paired with one of the five offerings in the temple. Uh, And so five stanzas, five offerings that people have found. There's something called the meal offering, meal, flour, obviously bloodless. And though it has many, many different threads of of application and meaning and symbolism, one simple one is that it, it involved pure flour. And so the commentators say that is like the purity of the life of Jesus Christ as our offering never sinning, he doesn't sin, lives a sinless life so that he might be our substitute and sacrifice for sin. And so those are always interesting to find those because you always think, oh, wow, God's so cool. 
I mean, and then you wonder how much other stuff you're missing, you know, that's really in the scriptures that he hasn't shown us yet, but we trust him. Now, we think of being ashamed as if it were a one-time decision or a major one. It's more subtle. We want to be popular. We want to be praised, well thought of. We've seen, however, that to be a poster boy or a girl for the Lord involves humiliation, sometimes a lot of humiliation. And so it's going to be a struggle for us until we're with the Lord uh, to not be ashamed. And, you know, to, to when, you know, when things aren't going exactly the way we think they should and people might look at us and think, wow, that's Christianity. I don't have anything to do with that. We're not in sin. We're just struggling. Give you an example, it's always better. When Pastor Chuck Smith was getting to the end, he was still in the pulpit with an oxygen tank and tubes. Critics, and there were lots of them, and they were Christians, and many were even in our camp at Calvary Chapel, they thought that he should get out of the way and turn the church over to a younger, healthy pastor because, I mean, what did that look like? You know, dragging his oxygen into the pulpit and all. And I'll tell you what it looked like. It looked like a man of God who had spent, I don't know, how many decades teaching the word of God, who loved his people and his people loved him, not hanging on to anything, teaching the word. And I'll tell you, I would rather have heard a man like that, doesn't have to be Chuck Smith, we don't idolize Chuck Smith, but take somebody who's been a Christian for 75 or 80 years, who's been in the ministry for 50 or 60 years, they've got something to say. And I'd rather listen to one sentence somebody like that said than come to, you know, some young, healthy, vigorous 25-year-old who's just getting going. I mean, that, that happened. I mean, you have to have that kind of turnover. But who said that Chuck shouldn't preach the gospel? No one. And so he went until he couldn't preach anymore because God took him home. And so I say, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you, Pastor Chuck, for that final lesson in humiliation. Mm-hmm.